Hey everybody, today we're talking about the Wilcoxon signed rank test. This is another non-parametric method for testing hypotheses about the median of a population. It's supposed to be an improvement upon the sign test that we saw previously, um, insofar as it's going to consider not just whether values are above and below the hypothesized median, but also considering by how much they might be. Let's have a concrete example to help us work through this idea. So here I have a 10 value data set and I'm going to test a null hypothesis that the mean is median rather is equal to 5.5 against a one-sided alternative that the median is greater than 5.5. We'll use a significance level alpha equals 0.05. By the way, as you glance at this data set, it seems like a reasonable hypothesis, HA, because these values by and large are larger than 5.5. So what we're going to do is we're going to take each of the values in our data set and compute how far away it is from the hypothesized media. So the absolute value of xi minus m0. Then we're going to put these in order. So we're assigning each of these 10 values a number between 1 and 10 basically. After that we're going to sign the ranks. So if you have a value in the data set that's below the median, you're going to make the rank negative. If you have a value that's, a below, that's above the median, then we're going to keep it positive. So now what we have is the numbers from 1 to 10 that are all plus or minus. We're going to add all of those up and that's going to be our test statistic. W equals that whole sum equals 25. Now if the null hypothesis is true, we expect this to be about 0 because the values above and the values below um, really should just be randomly signed. Then the p-value of the test is going to be the probability of getting a w that's more extreme. So for this one-sided alternative, probability that w is greater than or equal to what we got, greater than or equal to 25. So in order to compute that probability though, we actually have to understand the distribution of w. In other words, if this, if the population median is what the null hypothesis said it is, what are all the possible values of w we could get just by random chance? And where does ours fall in that, in that distribution? So in order to understand this, we're going to try and get a simpler perspective on the random variable w. The way we're going to look at it is that we've got the numbers from 1 to 10, those for sure, because they're ranks, um, and they're going to have each of them is going to have a plus or a minus. Now, assuming the null hypothesis is true, the plus or minus is just going to be like a coin flip, 50% positive, 50% negative. So we're going to view w as having the same distribution as a random variable y, which is the sum of a bunch of individual things that are those coin flips, where if you get ahead, then you're going to have a value of positive i, where i is between 1 and 10. And if you get a tail, you're going to have a value of negative i, again, i between 1 and 10. So all that we're doing with w is adding up the first n integers with random signs. Makes sense. The way to understand the distribution of y is to make use of moment generating functions. The reason that that's particularly helpful is because if you have independent random variables, then the moment generating function for a sum is the product of moment generating functions. And the moment generating function for any of our yi's here is going to be super easy. m sub i of t, the moment generating function for yi, is going to be 1 half e to the i t plus 1 half e to the negative i t. Now remember i here is going to be an integer between 1 and n. It's not the imaginary unit. Also remember the structure of our moment generating function. It's when you look at the exponential, the thing that comes before the t is the problem is the the outcome of the random variable, so i and negative i, and the numbers in front of the exponentials are the corresponding probabilities, so a one half probability of getting i and a one half probability of getting negative i. Then we can write the moment generating function for y as just a product of all those things. Now this is pretty ugly; it gets it gets massively rough very quickly. And if you don't believe me by looking at that simple expression, then let's look at a couple of values of n, n equals 2 and n equals 3. And you will definitely believe me when you see n equals 3. So for n equals 2, I have taken the moment generating functions um, for y1 and y2 and multiplied them and foiled them out. And now I can see the 
possible outcomes for y, negative 3, negative 1, 1, and 3, and the corresponding probabilities, all of them 1 fourth in this case. Okay, that's not too bad. For n equals 3, now we're multiplying three things. The moment generating functions for yi for i equals 1, 2, and 3. And you FOIL this out, and you get possible y values of negative 6, negative 4, negative 2, 0, 2, 4, and 6. Hey, notice that those possible y values are all going in increments of 2, and that's always going to be the case. Already we can see this calculation getting kind of ugly, so we want to we wanna find some shortcuts. There's really two things that we can do. First of all, we can notice that this distribution, the, the distribution of y and therefore of w, is going to have approximately a normal distribution. Um, we can compute probabilities that way. The second thing we can do is to do it directly using technology. In this video, we'll do the normal approximation. We'll save the technological approach for the, for the next video. OK, so there's really three elements here if we are trying to use a normal approximation. First of all, we need to show that y actually is going to have a normal distribution. That proof is going to be beyond what we can do in this course right now. Also, we're then going to need to know the parameters for that normal distribution, and that we can and should calculate. So we're going to do it by getting the mean and standard deviation, or I guess the mean and variance, of the individual yi's. So these are pretty direct to calculate because each of the yi's only has two values. We get the expected value of yi is 0 and the variance is i squared. Adding them up, um, in the variance case taking into account the fact that the yi's are independent, we get the expected value of y is 0 and the variance of y is going to be n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6. So if we're looking at a normal distribution to approximate the distribution of y, it should have this mean and variance. So this picture is taken from uh, an article by Ballard, Julian, and Hanley in 2017 showing normal distributions n of 0, comma, n, n plus 1, 2, n plus 1 over 6, and the discrete probability distribution for the test statistic w. And you can see that you don't have to get very large values of n before you start getting a pretty good fit to, the, to that normal distribution. By the time we get to n equals 10, you're in really good shape, and, and you can convince yourself by looking at this picture that slightly smaller values will be okay as well. Let's get back to our example. We want to apply a continuity correction if we want to be a bit more accurate on this. The random variable w is taking values in increments of 2, so we're going to use a, a continuity correction of, step, of size 1. In particular, to get the probability that the discrete random variable w is greater than or equal to 25, we're going to take the probability of getting a z-score greater than or equal to 24 in a normal distribution with mean 0 and standard deviation 385. And so I did that in R using a p-norm function, and I got about 11%. That is not a particularly small value of p. In particular, it's greater than the alpha that we set at the beginning of this problem of 0.05. And therefore, we're not able to reject H0. Even though the sample data seemed to indicate that the mean of the population, the median of the population was greater than 5.5, there is not sufficient evidence to conclude that. That certainly could have happened by random.